can I just have a show of hands and see how many anaesthetists or anesthesiologists there are here? So we've got, a, yeah, we've got about 15 or 20 percent, so that's fine. Okay, well, um, I'm just going to start off with who am I, and I, I, I don't have an identity problem or any psychiatric disorder as far as I know, but just to sort of run through who I am and, and what we've done in our unit, for which I take very little credit, and I think that we have to focus on the fact that it's a team. But we are mainly interested in um, ERAS for colorectal, and currently we have the shortest uh, patients today um, in the UK for colorectal. Um, we have produced numerous publications and RCTs. Um, we produced the first 23-hour stay for colorectal surgery and um, various other things. And myself and Dr. Scott, who you will meet later on, and Professor Tim Rockall are three of the advisors um, uh, nationally for ER. Now, within the UK, the role of the anaesthetist is changing. I think we've been quite slow to change in the UK, and certainly when I visited France about 15 years ago, they were streets ahead of us. Our world is no longer confined to theatre, and the, the concept of the perioperative physician is rapidly evolving from um, not only intraoperative care but in the preoperative preparation and in the early postoperative management and of course that makes us ideally um, positioned uh, for embarking and taking forward ERAS programs. Um, you've seen a more up-to-date slide than this. This is from Professor Fearon, uh, and it's nearly 10 years old, but it's a remarkably prescient uh, um, slide because, in fact, although some of the finer details have changed, uh, the fundamental um, elements actually haven't changed. And all these things we have already spoken about and you will be hearing about over the next 24 hours. So for instance, you, you'll see carbohydrate and then loading and no pre-med, no NG tubes, epidurals, avoidance of um, sodium and fluid overload, in other words, of therapy, keeping the patient warm, making sure they're mobilized, analgesia, prevention of post-operative nausea, vomiting, um, and then early um, nutrition and mobilisation. And um, the Department of Health in the UK has actually taken pretty much this data and uh, produced a slightly more, um, uh, if you like, user-friendly one, which is just basically taking the patient when they, they see their family, the doctor, and all the way through there is this, I don't know if you can see that, has SDM, which is shared decision making. And so all the way through from when the patient is prepared for surgery, from when they're admitted, they're intraoperative, they're post-operative and they're post-discharge care, the patient is, is all involved with uh, at the heart. So I'm just going to divide this talk into really two bits. One is some, um, if you like, some fundamental um, areas with which the anaesthetist is involved. And the second bit is really going to be a more uh, philosophical approach um, to um, uh, the role of the anaesthetist. Now, certainly in the UK, and I'm sure um, wherever you work, most of the anaesthetists don't meet the patients until immediately prior to surgery. And so clearly a lot of their optimization has to be done um, in pre-assessment cl clinics. And clearly obvious things like uh, getting their blood pressure under control and, and anemia and diabetes and angina clearly have to be sorted out. I think the real um, area of the pre-assessment clinics is really to pick out that hopefully relatively small percentage of patients who fall into the high-risk group. And it's these that need to be recognised and perhaps further assessed, so for things like cardiopulmonary exercise testing or with further invasive tests. 
And um, although anaesthetists are not normally involved in any of the multidisciplinary team meetings that our cancer doctors have been obviously running for the last 10 or 15 years, we're starting to get involved with these meetings because clearly for some patients who are perhaps elderly or frail or with disseminated malignancy, a major operation may not be in their best interest. And we may have to think about slightly lesser surgery, perhaps denting or whatever. Um, and that is a key part of the, um, of the, the anaesthetist in the preoperative phase. We've already heard quite a bit about carbohydrate loading and you're going to hear a lot more about that. I think the analogy that, that I would use is that you wouldn't send a marathon runner off to run the marathon starved and dehydrated and major surgery is pretty much that same experience. The thing that is of interest to us as anaesthetists is that um, uh, we are, we, we've now been able to show that even these carbohydrate drinks that people are having two hours beforehand, there's no effect on, um, on gastric emptying and no increase in uh, the um, risk of, of reflux. Um, Interoperatively, we all know that nasogastric tubes are now no longer routine, and I think the uh, important bit for us as anaesthetists is to make sure that we don't need the nasogastric tube put in because of something that we've done um, in the anaesthetic room. In other words, fill the patient's stomach with oxygen. You've seen a slide um, like this already, which is um, uh, basically looking at or trying to find this kind of sweet point, as it were, with uh, patients' intravenous fluid therapy. And we know that if we give too little fluid or too much fluid, that patients' morbidity and that their mortality will um, increase. So, too little fluid, they'll have a poor cardiac output and oxygen delivery. Too much fluid, they'll become endematous and there will be hypoxia at a cellular level. And um, uh, Prof. Hellamy, who wrote an editorial about this in 2006, uh, liken fluid therapy to, to, to the sort of mythical Scylla and Charybdis, which so we're trying to negotiate quite a narrow p passage through here, and on this side is this six-headed monster trying to kill us, and on this side is is a whirlpool. And clearly, if we get things um, you know too wrong either side, we're going to be very badly in trouble. And um, the role of fluid therapy, as I say, we'll, we will come back to. The, there are lots of things that we can do to look at how we monitor our fluid therapy, and I put up some of these as pointers. We have a low threshold for putting in our arterial lines. We can measure cardiac output and our arterial blood and gas analysis. We are enthusiasts of central venous um, uh, um, oxygen saturations, although much less so for CVP. We're also enthusiasts for the esophageal Doppler, um, but there is a huge debate. Uh, uh, part of that will take place, uh, I think, tomorrow on looking at the type of fluid and the monitoring and the perioperative duration. So I won't dwell on that. that. And then um, we have a major role for analgesia post-operatively, um, and in fact I'm going to be talking on that t t tomorrow morning, but uh, we will hear about multimodal analgesia, the importance of opioid sparing, the use of nerve blocks, and we're actually moving away from epidurals and 
vinyls into some of these more peripherally based nerve blocks. The use of really simple things like perioperative analgesia um, and uh, some other th th therapies as well. Now, because um, I like to think of anaesthetists as quite simple people, it, we wanted to, when we were first looking at this, we wanted a way in which we could, uh, if you like, simplify the role of an anaesthetist. And what we did was um, look at and, and uh, sort of put into practice this thing called the trimodal approach, which is looking at individualised fluid for therapy and effective and Easier. And then all the other aspects of Ken Fearon's slide were then all rolled into one. And Mike Scott and I therefore looked at these things. So we have individualised fluid therapy, we have effective analgesia, and then we have all the other bits. And then what happens if we get that bit right? Well, a number of other things follow on from that because um, we get um, uh, certainly we find that the gut function comes back early if patients aren't edematous and they have opioid free analgesia I'm going to talk a bit about the stress response and I make no apologies for uh, repeating some of the things that you've heard and we also find that our patients mobilise quicker so that then leads us on to the final thing, that if we get all of these things right, complications are reduced, healing is improved, and the length of the day is reduced. And I'm just going to uh, quickly look at some of those factors in a bit more detail. So the stress response we've heard about, we know that there's a marked neuroendocrine response to major surgery, and that has a fairly predictable metabolic response, uh, particularly catabolism and hyperglycemia. And then there is also a kind of local response, particularly mediated by cytokines, um, and we are familiar with that as well. And I think it's particularly that latter response that makes people feel unwell. And most of us here will have either had surgery or have had flu and know how terrible you feel. And I'm sure that uh, uh, much of that is due to high levels of cytokines. So we know that the ex excessive stress response is undesirable and um, it, it actually has some quite obvious adverse effects. Clearly, we don't want sympathetic overactivity, particularly patients who've got significant cardiovascular disease. We're trying to avoid hyperglycemia, nitrogen loss, muscle wasting. We want to avoid salt and water retention, and we are trying to not to have our patients feeling uh, weak. So, how do we practically uh, with Reduce and modify the stress response. Well, there was an editorial, so there's somebody leaning on the projector there. It makes me, it's giving me motion sickness. There we go. Thank you. Uh, 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 Kellett and Hyphen reviewed this in the BJA about three years ago, two and a half years ago. And aside from the type of analgesia that people use, there are lots of other things which appear clearly in our. Um, uh, on the normal protocol and this is getting the fluids right making sure our patients don't become cold um, making sure that we get adequate nutrition both with carbohydrate and loading and early oral nutrition there may be a role for immunonutrition and then a number of surgical factors that we've already heard about and then there's a few kind of weird and hacky things that are being tried and I'm sure actually that they will have a place as well. Reduction in complications was one of the other aspects on our slide and really for me probably one of 
the most important papers to come out in the last 10 years is, is Curie's paper, because I perhaps foolishly thought that complications in hospital were, uh, once they were sorted in hospital, those patients rejoined the cohort of patients who had not had complications. And we now know that that is very definitely not the case. These complications impact on patients' long-term survival. So if you have a serious complication within 30 to 10 days of surgery, your complication is reduced from uh, 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 sorry, your um, uh, survival is reduced from 18 and a half to five and a half years. It's the first time I've given a lecture where my hands haven't been shaking and the slide has, but I, perhaps I, you were expecting me to have a big intention tremor. Uh, the next thing is, uh, you may recall, we were talking about mobilisation and I think we have to ask ourselves, why is it patients don't mobilise? Why do they not get out of bed? Well, they may have symptoms, they may have pain, they may have weakness, they may have dizziness, including perhaps from the drugs we're giving them and for hypertension. They may be sick, they may feel unwell. They may be attached to a whole load of things, so drips and tubes. And there may be psychological reasons why patients don't wish to mobilise. They may be frightened of getting up. They may not want to walk around the hospital looking like that. So looking to the future on my penultimate slide, enhanced recovery is not just about length of stay. There's lots of other things that are involved and you're going to hear more about this over the, uh, the next 48 hours, but we've already looked at enhanced recovery in the elderly and it definitely has a place. We also um, know that if we get things right, that we're hoping for a reduction in complications a reduction in stress response and we're now starting to look at, as have others, our effects on looking at long-term survival. And I think my biggest wish would be able to come back here in a few years' time and not call this enhanced recovery but perhaps call it enhanced survival. And so with my summary slide, anaesthetists are involved really in all aspects of perioperative care the key areas are fluid and analgesia, and if we get those simple things right, there's um, a reduction in a stress response, an early enteral feeding and mobilisation. We find that that then gets patients out of hospital sooner with decreased, um, with decreased complications and healing. And as always, I am part of a team uh, and uh, I'm very grateful to my colleagues as well. Thank you very much indeed.